a pair of gloves. On the day that Elizabeth, younger daughter of the Roderick MacLeods, reached the age of sixteen, her parents decided that she should be sent to the same exclusive school in Switzerland which had so successfully educated her elder sister Flora. Grandfather MacLeod offered only a minor amendment to this program. Before she matriculated, he wished her to visit her cousins, residing at the seat of the MacLeod, Dunvegan Castle on the Isle of Skye. When Elizabeth first saw the home of her ancestors, there was a sheen on the calm waters about it, while a soft mist resting above raggedly embraced its crenellated towers. Soon the crew of the small boat that brought her from the mainland lowered the sail. They sang an old Hebridean song as they rowed her to the little dock where the MacLeod waited. He was a tall, bearded man, and his welcome, gruff and impassive, embarrassed her, though she felt he was glad to see her. His sister, also tall and reserved, stood beside him and bowed graciously. She was distressed, she said, that there were no young people at Dunvegan at this time. She had invited several of the MacLeod nephews and nieces, but all had already returned to their schools or were busy preparing to do so. Elizabeth found the grey castle fascinating. Its electric lights only gave emphasis to the age of its big dark rooms, and seemed the one compromise that its residents had been willing to make with modern times. She and her newfound relatives sat long over their after-dinner coffee that evening, while the MacLeod told her of Bonnie Prince Charlie's escape to the Isle of Skye and his stay at Dunvegan of the later visit of Dr. Samuel Johnson and his inevitable companion, James Boswell. Later, Elizabeth lay in an enormous old bed, studying Scottish chiefs by the light of a tiny reading lamp affixed to the headboard. She did not know when she first became aware of other light in the room. It seemed to have been there, and very naturally, for some time before she considered its presence. At the foot of the bed, in a circle of radiance, lay a pair of man-sized gauntlet gloves. On the wide cuffs, embroidered in red, she could see the outline of an intricate design. She looked up from the gloves and saw, standing beside the bed in the half-light, a tall, dark young man who was smiling at her. She did not remember his features later. She only recalled that his teeth gleamed white and regular, and that his eyes were bright with what seemed to be a friendly and curious interest. None of his dark costume was clearly visible, except white lace cuffs that fell from the ends of his jacket sleeves halfway over his long, slim hands. Thinking that her companion might be one of the MacLeod's nephews, whose absence had been lamented earlier in the day, Elizabeth turned the button of an electric lamp on her bedside table. The room flooded with light, and the gloves and the young man were gone. Elizabeth had none of the fear that she might have been expected to feel under the circumstances. She reasoned that she must have fallen asleep and dreamed the two apparitions, and she decided she would not trouble her host by speaking of them. She slept soundly, and her only recognition of what had happened found expression in a letter to her sister. In this she described to Flora the event of the previous night, though at the same time she ridiculed giving it any credence. She was the more out of patience with herself a week later when she said goodbye to the MacLeod and his sister, for she had not seen the young man or the gloves again, nor had she heard anything during her stay that might even partially explain her experience. Elizabeth's memory of her visit to Dunvegan was very dim seven years later. She had spent two years at the Swiss school and then come back to New York. There she had met and married Kenneth Warren, a charming and reasonably well-to-do young Virginian. Unlike most Southerners, her husband claimed few kinfolk. His only close relative, he told the MacLeods, was an elderly maiden aunt who lived in an old brick house in Dinwiddie County, 
and was too frail to come north for the ceremony. The marriage proved a very happy one. For four years the couple lived in a pleasant New York house on Murray Hill. Then on an April afternoon Kenneth Warren came home looking troubled. My aunt died and was buried nearly two weeks ago, he said. The information has just reached me, for there was some trouble in finding our address. We have inherited the house and must drive down at once to sell it and settle the estate. Elizabeth loved the dilapidated brick pile from the moment Kenneth drove her up the long drive. Though it was far from any neighbor and in such condition that she found difficulty in believing that it had been recently lived in, it satisfied a longing within her for just this kind of home. We must keep it, she told her husband delightedly. Perhaps we can restore only one room at a time, but it will be worth doing. Please say we keep it. Kenneth agreed, but without enthusiasm. I'm used to it, he said. It, it doesn't mean as much to me as it does to you. He went out for a walk in the spring twilight, leaving Elizabeth very busy at her rummaging. When he came back, she had prepared a supper from food they had brought with them, and had set it on the dining room table. She had found candles in the kitchen, and now, set in a half dozen candlesticks, they made a soft light that was grotesquely broken here and there by black shadows. Darling, said Elizabeth eagerly as soon as they were seated, I've had such an exciting time. It reminded me of something I dreamed when I was a schoolgirl visiting relatives abroad. I was prowling through the attic this afternoon and opened an old chest full of laces and dress materials. At the bottom was this pair of gauntlet gloves with red markings. Do tell me what you know about them. Do you suppose— but at sight of the gloves, Kenneth Warren, death pale, rose from the table. In three long strides he was at the door. There he turned to Elizabeth and spoke in a trembling voice. So you were the girl in the bed. Before she could grasp the meaning of these words, he was gone. So far as anyone knows, no human has seen him since that moment. Elizabeth searched for him frantically all night, and in the morning she summoned neighbors to her aid. They looked at her dubiously as she told her story. When she finished it, they shook their heads. No old lady nor anyone else had lived in that house, they said. Not in the last hundred years, anyway. They made a careful search for Kenneth. They found in the soft ground outside the doorway a man's footprints leading away from the drive, to the center of the open space that had once been the lawn of the old house. There they stopped. Ten years have passed, and Elizabeth has found no trace of her husband. She still has the glove.